Welcome to the latest edition of the Silk Road Movie Podcast, a weekly podcast bringing the very best in Chinese film to British and international audiences. My name is James, and I'll be taking you on this journey along the cinematic Silk Road, traveling between China and the West through films ranging from the classics of the past to new, modern stories and the films of the future. The podcast goes out weekly on Thursdays, and you can subscribe to us on all the usual major podcast platforms like iTunes, Spotify, Google and more, and you can also find us on Facebook, Twitter and social media. We're also going out over in China, and I really hope we're bringing film fans from the East and West together. Thank you very much for joining us for this episode of the Silk Road Movie Podcast in which we'll be focusing on one of China's foremost and most talented female filmmakers, Yang Lina. We're going to be looking at her works and her career, and we'll be talking a lot about her latest film, Spring Tide, which was recently released in China. I'm very excited to say that we have a, an exclusive interview with Yang Lina, which she very kindly recorded for us. And we're going to be listening to that later in the episode, so, so please do stay tuned for what's a, it's a really fascinating chat. During the episode, we'll also be listening to some music from the soundtrack to Springtide. Uh, really, it's a really beautiful piece of music by the Japanese composer Yoshihiro Hano. The subject of female filmmakers is very much a hot topic, with there being much more scrutiny now on gender equality in the film industry, I mean, obviously, rightly so, and on bringing authentic female stories to the screen. And this is true, you know, it's true around the world, uh, and it is true in China as well, where the film industry is often thought of as being rather patriarchal, and, you know, most famous Chinese film directors tend to be male. You know, certainly for, for Western audiences, I guess, uh, most of the films we'll see being released would be by, you know, Zhang Yimou, say, or Jia Zhang Ke. So, you know, mostly, mostly male film directors. This is something which is changing, though. Uh, and it's a very exciting time to see some of the fantastic films which are being made by female directors in China. Both, you know, experienced directors and young and up-and-coming directors. And it, it's, it's a perfect time to be discussing this topic and for us to be bringing some of these films and filmmakers to UK audiences. So we're going to be highlighting quite a lot of really talented female filmmakers and their works in coming episodes. But for the first of these, I, I think it's only fitting that we start with Yang Lina. This is partly because she's an amazing filmmaker, and she's had a very varied and interesting career, as we're, we're going to talk about. But it's also partly just on a personal level, because um, I'm a big fan of her work. And her, her films have won awards, and they've played festivals all around the world. I actually had the pleasure of meeting her. Uh, she was in London a few years back for screenings of some of her films. So Yang Lina is from the northeastern Chinese province of Jilin. And an interesting fact, which probably a lot of people might not know, is that she actually started her career as a dancer uh, after she, she graduated from the Art Academy of the People's Liberation Army back in 1995. After this, she also trained as an actress, and she acted and danced in a number of plays, ballets, and other productions. And, you know, actually another really interesting fact about her early career is that she was, she was one of the lead actors in Jia Zhang Ke's classic film Platform in the year 2000. Um, I'm sure a lot of you will have seen Platform. It's, a, it's an amazing film as well. And it's, uh, I'm sure it's one we'll be talking about in another episode. But before Platform, in the late 1990s, 
Yang Lina was looking for, for other ways to, to like express herself artistically. And so she moved into filmmaking. Uh, she basically was, you know, she was self-trained and she started off by making independent documentaries. Yang Lina's first film was uh, Old Man, which was in 1999. This was a, it's a documentary which charts the, the daily lives of her elderly neighbors who are, they're living in like a, a residential commune in Beijing. The film deals with uh, a number of different social themes, but in particular, it, it kind of focuses on their loneliness in their daily lives. The film was one of the first DV films made in China. It was very, it was very apparent that the film was very much her voice. And as with a lot of other Chinese independent doc filmmakers at the time, as well as directors, she was also the film's cinematographer, she was the producer, and she was later the editor, you know, as well as writing and planning the whole film. The film was critically acclaimed around the world, and it, it screened and won prizes at a lot of top documentary festivals like uh, Cinema du Real, uh, Leipzig, and Yamagata. And this really announced Yang Lina as a, as a powerful new voice in Chinese documentary cinema. I mean, you know, even more so with her being female and having managed to make this kind of breakthrough was really, you know, really impressive. So she followed uh, Old Man in 2001 with Home Video. And this is, it. it's an amazingly intimate and personal piece of work. And uh, I have to say, it really surprised me when I, I finally saw it a few years ago. The film's name, you know, Home Video, is it's actually really accurate. as a, The film is, it is a home video in the truest sense. And it basically sees Yang Lina taking a single camera and using this to, to try and uncover the reason behind her parents' seemingly sudden decision to divorce. Um, so she's carrying out interviews with her mother, her father and her brother, which are really incredibly open. And they're often, you know, they're often very painful. In interviews, uh, Yang Lina has spoken about the film uh, and about how each of these different family members had different memories and different uh, reasons for the situation although none of these reasons in the film are seen as being less valid or important than the others. The film covers topics which you know, we'll see in her later works, dealing with you know, complexity of modern family life, differences between generations, and the, and the impact of separation. I mean, you know, covering subjects which are close to home can be, you know, it's a fairly common way to start for indie doc filmmakers, but I think it's really rare to find a film which is, is personal, and which kind of hits as hard as home video. And I was really impressed by how balanced the film is. And it's, it's really not a film about looking for blame, but it, it's a very searching, uh, no holds barred sort of look into a family. Her next few films came from 2007 to 2009, and these were another four documentaries, all of which were highly acclaimed, and they, they really saw her cementing her position as a top director. The films covered, uh, they covered a range of social issues, though I think these ones perhaps had more of a, a focus on the older generation in China. So we had um, Let's Dance Together and The, the Love Life of Lao An, uh, looking at retired couples who fall in love while dancing in the gardens of Beijing, and at a, at a 90 year old man chasing a younger woman, despite being married to a, a long suffering wife. Yang Lina was talking about these films in an interview, and she said at the time, I'm for seniors falling in love. Seniors have the same emotional needs. The ability to love does not diminish with age. And I think that this really comes across in these films. And despite dealing with social issues, I mean, they're very tender films character-driven, very moving films. And they see Yang Lina showing great skill in involving viewers with the, with the lives and the experiences of her characters. 
After returning to her old neighborhood for the for the short documentary, uh, My Neighbors and Their Japanese Ghosts, which was, it's made up of interviews with elderly residents about their memories of the Japanese occupation. Her last documentary was called Wild Grass. Uh, this was made in 2009, and it was it was following children at an orphanage in northern China, and it was shot over a period of some 14 years. Both of these films are also very, very touching. Uh, they're, they're a little different. I, I think they're more like social histories and explorations of change in modern China. In 2013, Yang Lina released her first ever fiction feature called Longing for the Rain, which she also scripted, and uh, this was set to be the first in a planned trilogy about the lives of women in China. The film is a challenging and unconventional look at female sexuality in modern Chinese society. And it revolves around an upper middle class housewife called Fang Lei, uh, who's played by the actress uh, Zhao Siyuan. Despite having a comfortable, affluent life with her husband and daughter, Fang Lei is uh, sexually frustrated, and she starts to dream about making love to a mysterious man. Finding fulfillment with her dream lover, she becomes more and more obsessed, but you know, her life starts to fall apart, and she turns to a, a Taoist monk for help. The film has the same strong sense of character uh, that Yang Li did show in her documentaries. And you can see with Longing for the Rain, her, her direction here is it's actually quite uh, experimental and unconventional. And it mixes together like social issues and what is you know, possibly supernatural. But I think what's more important for me and which really makes uh, Longing for the Rain stand out and to make it such a great film is that it, it, it feels like it has a very authentically female voice. It is rare to see this kind of film being made in China, and I think you can really see this in particular in its, uh, the way it treats its sexual themes and content, and I think it would be very different if you saw this kind of content coming from a male director who's kind of trying to uh, inhabit the female perspective. <laughs> It's also really impressive how smoothly Longing for the Rain sees Yang Lina making the shift from documentaries to fiction, which is, you know, it's a pretty, pretty huge leap. But she, she's like bringing the same kind of intimacy and humanism. And I love the way she managed to give the film a look and a feel that's both, it's both naturalistic uh, and like dreamlike at the same time. Longing for the Rain premiered at Rotterdam. And it went on to play a long list of festivals around the world. And it was, it was nominated for awards in a lot of different places, like uh, the Golden Horse Awards, Five Flavors, and other festivals. Uh, it won the, the Firebird Award at the Hong Kong International Film Festival. It's a, it's a fantastic film. And for me, it's really one of the key works which I'd recommend to anyone who has an interest in female Chinese filmmakers or, you know, or modern Modern Chinese cinema in general and films about society, it's, it's one you really have to check out. Okay, so as promised, uh, we're very excited to have an exclusive interview for the Silk Road Movie Podcast with Yang Lina, talking about Spring Tide, and uh, talking about her career as a female filmmaker in China. Mama, I said the back of the head or the back of the head? Let's try it. Let's try it. How many nights? 
，我想躺在妈妈的怀里，但是大多数时间。我都躺在了男人的身边。别人是侵犯你的报道，他做那个缺德事，你就说他性格好，你这个不是做记者的吗？怎么就这么公平公正呢 ？So a quick word first though about Spring Tide.、Uh, Spring Tide is her second fiction feature, after you know we've talked about Longing for the Rain, and the film had its premiere at Shanghai International Film Festival in 2019. Before going on to play at a number of other festivals later in the year, and it won various awards and nominations. It was set for release in cinemas in March in China, and you know, unfortunately, this didn't happen due to the due to the COVID nineteen situation. The film was recently released online in China, and it it's been amazingly successful, in particular among female audiences. And you know, that that's something we'll talk to Yang Lina about. But first, yeah, let's、uh, let's say a big congratulations on Spring Tide, which I personally think it's an amazing film. It's a very important film, and I actually think it's even stronger than Longing for the Rain. It is your life's murder weapon. Around the people, around the people, for so many years, there is really no sorrow. I have no dreams about the future. I was born here, I will die here, and I will die here. How do you know that? 我看你日记了。我不能够把你交给一个想要杀死你的人。在这个家里没有什么事，你都没有钱，你必须要我。我老了，我还要看你的脸，知道吗？能不能是我要给你砸个磕头？那你就完了。我们干活，干活，干活。So let's talk to Yang Lina. She's very kindly responded to some questions, and we've had,、uh, translated these to pass through to you. So here we are with her replies, along with a, a very warm greeting from her to our listeners in the UK and beyond. Hello, uh, British film fans. I am Yang Lina. <laughs> Spring Tide is the second film in a trilogy about women and the family unit, following on from Longing for the Rain. With these films being having made over a period of years, so you know, Longing for the Rain was two thousand thirteen, and、uh, Spring Tide, two thousand nineteen. Have you seen Chinese society changing during this time with regards to the role of women, and you know, how has this been reflected in your own storytelling and filmmaking? At the same time, Spring Tide deals with three women from different generations, and it follows a journalist who lives with her mother and her young daughter, and the three are very complex and fully realized characters. Do you see these three women as having been shaped by the different and changing time periods of modern Chinese history, which they've grown up during? Uh, from the Spring Tide production to the Spring Tide, it's been about ten years. Uh, this ten years seems very short. There's no sudden change, but it's also a generation's birth and a generation's death process. If the Spring Tide is still from the beginning of the family, then the Spring Tide is a generation's birth process. I think the Spring Tide is a generation's birth process. I think the Spring Tide is a generation's birth process. 我会说，推开一扇中国家庭的门，每个门里边都坐着类似的姥姥和母亲，他们的身影就在我们身边，我不能忽略不见。呃，所以我说这是一个非常典型的中国式家庭，或者说是中国式母女的关系，它是有中国特色的。所以影片播放。后呢，我们收到了特别多的观众来信，或者在影片播出的弹幕上，都表达了自己看到这部影片的感受。他们说，影片就像镜子一样，照射到了自己和母亲的关系。那这些共鸣和共振，都让我觉得这部影片在这个时间出现是挺好的时机。就中国关于这类的母女关系的影片很少，其实。I should also say a very big thank you to Jan Sigal, who's joining us here to read Yang Lina's answers. It has been nearly ten years from the initial production of Longing for the Rain to the release of Spring Tide. It looks short between the ten years, and there seem to be no obvious changes. But meanwhile, it marks the process of birth and aging for one generation. If we say Longing for the Rain is from the point of view of a housewife. 
What I want to construct in Springtide is about the fate of three generations. I said in the film promotion that when you open the door on one Chinese family, in every household sit the, sit the grandmother and the mother. We can find them beside us and I cannot ignore them. Therefore, I think this is a very typical Chinese family or Chinese style mother-daughter relationship. It is a Chinese characteristic. We received letters of review from the audience after screening and we saw the audience showed their feelings about it by pop-up messages on the screen. They said this film is like a mirror that reflects their own relationship with their mothers. Such resonance makes us believe that this is the best time to show this film. There are rarely Chinese films about the mother-daughter relationship, in fact. Okay, so since Springtide hasn't been released in the UK, uh, let me just say a little bit about the plot of the film. So it follows a family of three women, uh, the three generations which uh, Yang Lin has mentioned. But it kind of focuses on a journalist in her 40s called Jian Bo. Uh, she's played by an actress called Hao Lei, who I think some of you would recognize maybe from Lo Ye Summer Palace and Mystery. So she lives with her elderly mother, Ming Lan, uh, who's played by Hong Kong Taiwanese actress Elaine Jin Yan Ling. And she's, she's an award-winning industry veteran. Who's been in, she's been in a few Edward Yang films. Uh, and she was recently very, very good in Mad World and Port of Call, which are, you know, which are both really good films as well. The elderly Ming Lan, is a, she's a very popular figure in the local community. And she organizes like a, a lot of old revolutionary song competitions. It's clear from the very start that this mother and daughter are two very, very different women. And there's kind of a wall of sorts between them. And you also have Jian Bo's young daughter called Wan Ting, who's played by the young actress uh, Chu Jun Shi. And she's frequently caught in the middle of their battling. Uh, and as the film goes on, the tension builds between the women and past secrets are revealed, and we start to find out more about why they act the way they do. But yeah, I, I think Yang Lina's right, and the, there aren't very many Chinese films which, which really explore the, the relationship between mothers and daughters, or you know, at least certainly not to the, to the very in-depth level which Spring Tide does. And the film, uh, for me, the film is it's first and foremost, uh, it's a very searching character study. The three female lead characters are all, they're all very complex. Uh, they're extremely well written by Yang Lina and her script does kind of link them to the, the period of modern Chinese history they grew up in. I think this is used to provide insight into the ways in which they communicate with each other and relate to each other or, or, or in which ways in which they fail to communicate you know, and relate to each other. And it's not really a film which is big on obvious political allegory or sort of heavy metaphor, which uh, I think is also cool. Similarly, while Springtide, it does deal with a variety of social issues, like, uh, for example, it starts with uh, an opening scene showing pa parents being like really angry after learning that a, a school teacher has been molesting his students. But Yang Lina, she really kind of weaves all of these different social issues into the background as part of the, the overall narrative. And she, she really lets the experiences of her characters take center stage. The film does, it does deal with some very Chinese situations and relationships, you know, culturally specific. But I think it's the strength of her characters which really makes it still, it's still very relatable. And I still think it's very understandable for international audiences. The relationship between Jambo and her mother uh, and the way it changes kind of, in a way, drives the film. And it's very gripping. And this, it feels like um, a quiet war of attrition between the two women. And this is, it's actually, it is actually quite funny in places, but it's, you know, it's very cruel in other places. Uh, and I think the cultural underpinnings and themes are really fascinating. Uh, like the, the way the mother's frustration at her failed attempts to, she has, she's constantly trying to set Jambo up with, uh, with men. And this is, it's very interesting and it really adds another layer of depth to the film. The film has quite a, an ambiguous ending, you know, w without having any spoilers, but 
I think it's an ending which seems you know, hopeful for the future and for the younger generation of Chinese women. Do you think different audiences will interpret the ending differently? Uh, 一定是个开放性的结尾我们的小女孩顾婉婷那个扮演者有一次在跟观众Q&A的时候 the ending is open. Our little girl Wo Wan Ting said once during a Q&A session with the audience when being asked what the ending means. She said the flowing water in the end is the grandma's tears. Different audiences will have a different interpretation. No matter which interpretation they have, I think it's all fine. This is something I leave to the audience. And I personally believe each generation will become better than the previous one. And in fact, this is how it should be. If each generation were worse than the previous one, it would be a tragedy. Yeah, so I, I, I definitely agree that different audiences will understand the ending differently. But I, I do myself, I do find it an upbeat ending. And I think uh, it seems to at least be uh, suggesting hope for the future. Uh, through the young daughter wanting. Um, I mean, throughout the film, she is like the liveliest and the most energetic of all the three main characters during the film. And I think, you know, like how Liang Lina has said there, like if one generation is worse than the past, it will be a tragedy. And that's, I don't get that feeling from the film that Yang Lina is suggesting that tragedy is coming. Yeah, I mean, this kind of ending can be a bit tough for some audiences, you know, who maybe are looking for a very definite conclusion. But I think for Spring Tide it works really well, as the, the film as a whole is quite ambiguous. I think I would call it an observant film, rather than one which uh, spells everything out for the viewer. And it's not the kind of film which is necessarily going to you know, spoon feed you the answers throughout. It's similarly a very non-judgmental film, and all the characters each have their own crosses to bear. And when the dark secrets from the past come to light later on, you can see that Yang shows how each of them have their own they have their own perspective, uh, different memories of events from the past. And we kind of see what's really interesting is that we see how these have shaped their own lives, their relationships and their own perceptions. And uh, I, I think in this, Springtide recalls Yang Lina's, uh, her early documentary, uh, Home Video, which we, which we discussed earlier. Springtide has been very successful on its uh, recent release online in China. Do you think there's a growing audience for authentic female stories and feminism in Chinese films? Because of the pandemic, the film has been released online, although it had been planned for a theatrical release in March. It has exceeded our expectation in its popularity and reach. Female audiences seem to be larger than male ones. Especially in recent years, people in the mainstream are talking about topics relating to feminism and women in the arts and so on. The female numbers will keep growing with the growth of feminist groups, which I think follows the historical course of social progress. I think it's great that Springtide has been so successful online in China. 
as I know, you know, there's a lot of other new films which still haven't been released either in cinemas or online due to the, you know, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. The online market, it's growing really quickly in China. And it's good to see dramas like this being embraced by audiences, you know, as well as the kind of uh, short form content and genre films which we tend to associate with online. I know that the also like the, the online market audiences, they might lean towards younger audiences and male audiences. And so Spring Tide doing as well as it has feels, it feels like an important step. Most audiences watch films online using their mobile phones and on the move, you know, maybe on the underground. Uh, so kind of in like small pieces, maybe 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there. And so a film like Spring Tide, which, you know, it's over two hours long. It is quite slow moving, you know, in a good way. This doesn't automatically sound like the kind of film that would people would watch on their phone. And so, again, I find it, it's really cool that it's had the success and it's very interesting to see. I'm definitely seeing more and more work from female directors coming from China, uh, in particular from young female filmmakers. And there have been some really, really great films turning up at like a first film festival and other events which are platforms for new filmmakers. As Yang Lin has said, the, the kind of stories that these female filmmakers are telling about feminism and, and similar themes, they are becoming a bit more mainstream. And I think that's very important as well, just in terms of reaching wider audiences for these films and filmmakers. I guess I, I'm not really surprised that Springtide seems to have been reaching more female audiences. I mean, just on the basis that it's a very female-centric story based around female characters, and it's, you know, it's essentially a female drama. But I, I really hope it's being watched by male audiences as well. And uh, it deals with a lot of really wide-reaching themes. And it's not only a film suitable for female viewers. And in a way, you know, you don't want to sound reductive by saying this is a female film. And it makes it sound like guys shouldn't watch it, which is, uh, which is nonsense. It's definitely a film which anyone should be able to watch and enjoy. Stories about women are fairly common in Chinese cinema, both uh, independent films and commercial films, but they're often made by male directors. Do you think that things are changing and that there's now more opportunities for female directors? Yesterday,我和朋友聊天,从中国建国以来的第一位女导演王平聊到今天我们这一代,女性导演的人数到工作机会和被认可几率都明显的在提高,但和男性比较还是差很多。我看国外情况其实也差不多了，就由于我们本身社会构造是男权和父权主导，所以也有女导演拍的女性故事不一定是女性立场的，男导演拍摄女性故事不一定是出于女性关怀的。呃，但是我能看到现在和未来的趋势
and she soon became a very respected director, and her work was very influential. I mean, for Western audiences, she, she's fairly unknown. Uh, probably her best-known work internationally is the, the 1965 film called The East is Red. And this is a, it's a song and dance musical about the formation of the Communist Party. She was still very much an active filmmaker up to the time of her death, and her last film was called uh, The Song of the Chinese Revolution, and that was in 1985. Although some of Wang Ping's films featured leading women, uh, the narratives mostly focused on class struggles, which was the main theme for the time. And I think it's really interesting to compare her works and works of you know, female filmmakers of different generations with the works of more modern female filmmakers, Yang Lina, and to see the kind of differences in how they tackle their subjects and their characters. But yeah, Yang Lina's right. The, the patriarchy, the film industry, is, it's definitely not something we only see in China. And it's fair to say that the film industry of Western countries and pretty much you know, everywhere in the world, they're also male-dominated. But it is great to see that things are at least starting to change. And it's very encouraging to hear that Yang Lina thinks that there are, there are more opportunities opening up for female directors. Springtide, it does feel like a film about female characters and stories, which comes from a female perspective. And for me, there's a definite, there's a different feel to the Springtide and to her other films, say, compared to those of you know, male filmmakers who are dealing with female stories. I mean, this isn't to say that male directors can't tell female stories, but I think it's important to see filmmakers like Yang Lina getting their works made and screened. I think that this is something we are seeing changing around the world, and as Yang Lina says, this, this does seem to be a trend. And hopefully, you know, we're going to see more films like Springtide being made in China and, you know, and everywhere. You've been known as one of the, the foremost female directors working in China over the last 20 years. How much of a struggle has it been for you as a female filmmaker in China? Uh,大家的厚爱,我没觉得我是那么重要的导演,但作为一个行业从业者,我希望在职业生涯中能顺利制作完成自己想拍的故事,保留影片的完整度,题材上的开放性不被折损才是最重要的。Thank you very much for your great kindness. I think I'm not the foremost. As a filmmaker, I hope I can complete what I want to make during my career, and it is very important to keep the level of completeness and the openness of themes. I think, it, I think it's fair to say that Yang Lina is being very modest here. Uh, she really is one of the most important female filmmakers working in China over the last couple of decades. But I'd also say that she's one of the top filmmakers working in China in general, you know, male or female. And I'm sure that her work's going to get more well-known in the West and around the world over the coming years. I'm sure she must be having a lot of influence on up-and-coming filmmakers, especially with the, the success of Spring Tide and how popular it's been. So for the final question, you started your career making independent documentaries, also about the subject of families, the experiences of women, and different generations in China. But why did you make the shift to fiction features, and do you find a big difference between the two filmmaking forms? Documentaries <laughs> 本身就对我个人来说，就一个是向内看，一个是向外看，一个是名利场，一个是和名利无关。就我更喜欢纪录片，它让我会成为更好的作者。Documentary and fiction features are both film to me, which focus on caring and constructing the character's fate. Apart from the differences in approach to work, one looks inward while the other one looks outward. 
One is about Vanity Fair, while one is free of it. I prefer documentary because it helps me to become a better filmmaker. I'd say all of Yang Lina's films, whether documentary or fiction, are they're very intimate, humanistic works, and they, they kind of have a, an autobiographical or self-exploratory air. And so it's very interesting to hear that she prefers documentary. I do think there's, a, there's definitely a lot of similarity between her docs and her, her fiction as well. So if you look at you know, Longing for the Rain and Spring Tide, just in terms of how she approaches and deals with her subjects and characters. One of the real strengths of her fiction filmmaking is being able to write and shoot characters which are just as real and believable as the people she covers in her docs, and how she manages to balance this with engaging plots and stories and in dealing with social issues. It's also very interesting to hear that she thinks documentary has made her a better filmmaker, and I think that there's not too many directors from China or, or indeed internationally who, who kind of switch between the two different forums. I mean, obviously in China, I can think of, you know, Jia Jiangke does this. I think having this background in doc making can, can really help to ground a director and to, you know, to maybe to make their visual approach and techniques more rooted in realism. And you can definitely see this in Springtide as well, which is, it's a lot more, it's a lot more down to earth looking than a lot of other dramas. And to me, th this makes it even more believable. The film was shot by the cinematographer called Jake Pollock, who also recently worked on films like uh, Lo Yes, The Shadow Play, and Derek Sang's Soulmate. And he works, he works really well with Yang Lida and Spring Tide to create this kind of uh, mixed aesthetic for the film. I personally like this look a lot, and I, I do prefer something which feels naturalistic like Spring Tide, rather than sort of you know, artificial melodrama. And that's something which Springtide really doesn't have any of, despite, if you look at the plot, just on paper, it sounds like in the hands of another writer or director, it could have been, it could have been some kind of soap opera, I think. And what Young Lena does here, it definitely isn't. But it's very powerful when documentary and fiction approaches are combined like this. And I think this style is very key for Young Lena. Uh, and I think it's something we'll continue to see her explore and develop in her future films, which I will be really looking forward to seeing. Thank you everyone. I hope you can see the Thank you, James. So Young Lena would just like to say a, a very big thank you to everyone. Uh, and that she's very much looking forward to, to hearing what people think about Springtide. And what they take from the film. So we'd like to say a very big thanks to Young Lena herself for the for the interview, which I'm sure you all find very interesting. And it, it, it's great to have heard more about her filmmaking career and about Spring Tide itself. And I really hope the film is going to be making its way to the UK before too long. I'll also say thanks again to Jan Seagal for joining us for Young Lena's interview. I definitely suggest you check out any of Young Lena's other works. You know, Longing for the Rain, her her earlier docs, everything. She's, she's made some really amazing films. And as I've said, she really is one of the foremost and most important female filmmakers working in China over the last couple of decades. So that's about it for this episode of the Silk Road Movie Podcast. And thanks for listening. Do subscribe to the podcast, follow us on social media, and we'll keep you up to date on the very best in Chinese cinema. I'm James, and I hope you've enjoyed your journey along the cinematic Silk Road to China. <laughs> <laughs>